Well, let's open our Bibles this afternoon to the book of Matthew, the first gospel uh, and book of the New Testament. And we're just going to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 5, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, and um, just about the salt of the earth and the light of this world. So Matthew 5, uh, found on page 760 in our Bibles. It says there, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is, of course, the word of the Lord. And before I get into Nehemiah this afternoon, brothers and sisters, I want to just give a brief introduction of where we're going in this sermon, and then we'll enter our text. So my text is um, the book of Nehemiah. At Mercy Church, where I pastor, we've been doing a series uh, in, through the book, and we finally arrived at chapter 11. But let me just connect a few dots for you and put some things into context as we enter this passage this afternoon. Well, Nehemiah is, of course, a book in the Old Testament, and it's a book about Jerusalem, really, um, about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So where we find ourselves in the book of Nehemiah this afternoon is now in Jerusalem. But the book doesn't start in Jerusalem. It starts actually in Susa. Susa is a city in Persia. Its remains are in Iran um, at this present time. And Susa, in so many ways, represents what you would call the city of man. And Jerusalem, on the other side, would be considered the city of God. And I don't know how many of you know uh, Augustine, the, the, the church father, but he once wrote a book called The City of God. It's quite a large book of 800 pages. You, you don't finish that in one night unless you're really, really fast. But it's pretty heavy in theology. And what he does, he compares the city of man with the city of God and proves and shows what it means to live in this world. That is uh, basically the, the reality of a city of man. And he's in connection to the Roman Empire with all his indulgences and indulgencies, I guess you could say. It's, it's desire to, to, to gratify the flesh, this false worship, this opposition against the church. That's the city of man. And, and, and as Christians, of course, we sit, live in the city of God. We are, we're members of that city. We don't live there. We, we have our foot, you could say, in that city. We'll get back to that. But Nehemiah begins, you could say, in the city of man. He begins in Susa. And the spirit of that city in Scripture is called Babylon. Susa and Babylon, you could say, are sisters. It was taken over by Persia, and they created a new capital, but it was really Babylonian in a sense. And that spirit, that spirit of Babylon, existed in the days of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah had a hunger and a thirst and a desire to be in the city of God. And Nehemiah, we think, is, was a eunuch who served the king of Susa as his cupbearer. But when opportunity came for him to uh, transition, I guess you could say, from the city to serve in Jerusalem, to, to rebuild the walls, God opened that door and he went as quickly as he could to the city. And we have this amazing building project in the book of Nehemiah, which in 52 days they rebuilt all the walls of the city. It's an unbelievable feat. After the walls were built, that was the first seven chapters, after the walls were built, God showed his deeper concern for his people. And his deeper concern for his people, even for you this afternoon, is you can say the walls of your heart, the character of your heart, what's happening in your heart. And so he, he moves from the walls to the restoration of worship, the restoration of, you can say, God's people's heart, the hearts of God's people. And, and it begins then in chapter 8 with, with Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah were compatriots, and, and Ezra opening the book of the law and reading it for six hours. That would be from now until, I don't know, what, 11 or something? 10.30? Kids ready for that? You're like, 
So for six hours, he, he opened God's word, and the priests were translating it for people. But what happened in those six hours was something amazing. We talk about the Asbury um, um, revival. It, it, what happened here was the, you know, the, wall, the, 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 the revival of Jerusalem, because within those six hours, people started to weep. They wept over their sin. They realized that they had broken faith with God. That's chapter 8. Chapter 9, not only did they go back to that again the next day or a few days later, probably the next week, they then began to confess their sins and, and hear God's word again, and that was another six hours. And then chapter 10 of Nehemiah, this revival keeps, keeps bearing fruit, you could say. In chapter 10, they have this recommitment to, to the word of God. And here's just the four things that they recommit to. They first re recommit to, 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 to the reading of God's word. I challenge my congregation to, to, to personal devotion to God's word. If you want to see revival happen, if you want to see your growth happen in your faith, if you want to get closer to Christ, you need to be in this word, and you need to be in the word daily. If you read lesson, it's proven, or science, not science maybe, but they've done studies on this, that people who read the word of God four, four times a week or more, so four days a week or more, begin to see changes in their life. If you want to read cursory read one or two times a week, you're not going to see a lot of change in your life. So I was going to call our church the four plus church. And we're going to read the Bible more than four times a week in personal devotion. Give yourself that hour, give yourself that half hour of deep devotion in God's word, and you will begin to see changes in your life. But they recommitted themselves to that. They committed themselves to holy marriages. Marriages between one man and one woman, the woman and the man both loving Yahweh. The woman and the man both loving Jesus. That's holy matrimony united in the one faith for the glory of God. They committed themselves to that. They committed themselves to Sabbath rest. They were no longer going to be slaves of, 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 the, of money, of all, the mighty, almighty dollar. They were not going to be slaves of work. They were going to allow God and trust God that he would provide for them. So they worked six days and rested on the seventh. So that six in one reality still is for God's people today. And finally, they committed themselves to generous giving. For the church of Jesus Christ to grow, the people of God need to open their pockets. If you love Jesus, you'll show that on your, on your bank app. It will, you'll notice as you scroll on your bank app that Jesus is number one by where your money flows during the month. They committed to the service of God and they gave generously for the kingdom of God to be built. That's chapter 10. Now finally, we're at chapter 11. And I think the fruit of revival continues in chapter 11 because now they have a passion in chapter 11, as we will say, see, to repopulate Jerusalem. And there's a lot more going on than just a bunch of people moving into Jerusalem, as we will learn. But their love for the city of God, for all that that city represented, becomes very evident in this story that we're going to read this afternoon. And what moves them then to this physical reality of moving from the town into the city is undergirded by a spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality is a desire to serve the king of kings according to his will. That's where the passion was. And they want to see the city, which is really the epicenter of Judah and the epicenter of Israel, but also in some ways the epicenter of the world of that day, to be a city like a light on the hill, shining forth the goodness and the righteousness and the holiness of God. And they wanted to shine that forth. And as God's people today, we don't need to move to Jerusalem, of course, but our desire to serve him and shine that same light is a spirit that lives within us, or it should, also for the glory of God. So that's kind of the context to our passage this afternoon. So I think it's going to come up on the screen. Otherwise, it's Nehemiah chapter 11. You can find it in your pew Bibles. And we're going to read um, parts of that chapter. Not the whole chapter, just parts of the chapter. So Nehemiah chapter 11. I'm going to have you move very fluidly through this chapter with me. Thank you in advance. I'm going to actually skip many of the names. It's a quite a long chapter, and I would encourage you to read those over on your own. 
But I think you get the idea by the verses I'm going to read and the kind of the synopsis I'm going to give on the chapter uh, before I, I proclaim it. So, uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, page 378, beginning in verse 1. Now, the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem. The NIV has the leaders settled in Jerusalem. And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the province who who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his property, in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived certain of the sons of Judah and of the sons of Benjamin. I'm just going to pause there. And, and what you have following that is a breakup of the groups of people that moved in. So you have descendants of Judah. That's the verses 4 through Six. These are descendants of Judah. And just one note I want to make in verse 6 of chapter 11. And it says this. All the sons of Perez, a descendant, of course, of Judah, who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. The NIV has men of good standing. These were men who committed themselves to moving in, who were beyond reproach, who walked with integrity, who were there, who was there to defend the city. Then in verse 7, we have the descendants of Benjamin and all those folks that moved into the city. And then in verse 10, we have the priests who moved into the city. And I just want to pick up verse 14 again. It said, and their brothers, mighty men of valor, 128, and then their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of Hegadelon, Hegolim. And so these were um, also men of standing who moved in. And then I want to just move to verse 17. Because verse 17 is also an interesting verse. It says, And Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, son of Asaph, who was leader of the praise, who gave thanks. I think if you know your Bible a little bit, um, the sons of Asaph, of course, wrote Psalms in the book of Psalms. And they're recorded here, and they may have been writing psalms at this time as well. They were descendants of Levi. And then you have, in verse 19, the gatekeepers. Uh, Verse 20, you have the priests and the Levites. Verse 21, the the temple servants. And then the chief of the Levites, verse 22. And then we pick up the middle of verse 22 again. The overseers of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, the son of Bani, son of Hashabiah son of Mataniah, son of Micah, of the sons of Asaph again, the singers over the work of the house of God. So we get these singers again, they're writing music, serving the Lord, and it continues. um, Verse 23, for theirs was a command from the king concerning them and a fixed provision for the singers as the day required. So the king of Susa was actually funding the music uh, and the singing in Jerusalem. That was an interesting fact as well. And then you continue on with some descendants that moved into the state in the towns. And finally, in verse 36, we read, And certain divisions of the Levites in Judah were assigned to Benjamin. So we have this marriage, you could say, between the line of Judah and the line of Benjamin, finding places both in the city and the surrounding regions. This is the word of the Lord. My theme for this afternoon is inhabiting the city of God. Inhabiting the city of God. And what we're going to look at this afternoon um, is two things. One, the physical reality of what that looked like for God's people and maybe what it looks like for us. And the spiritual, spiritual reality, the kind of the eternal reality of being an inhabitant of the city of God. Now, I, I believe that one of the biggest decisions, not the biggest, but one of the biggest decisions that you make in the course of your life is where you're going to live. It's really your house purchase. Not everybody has that opportunity to purchase a house, so maybe it's where you're going to rent. But not everybody has the opportunity to choose where they're going to rent, but typically they can choose the town. It's a big decision. But what this passage is trying to show us, and as I will try to prove, where you're going to live 
and why you're going to live there should be spiritually motivated. I'll say that again. Where you're going to live and the reason why you're going to live there should be spiritually motivated. This is the mark of being a Christian, that you, that you put these big decisions before the throne room of grace and you ask God to lead you. Is this where you want us to go or not? It's a spiritually motivated uh, decision. So here's what's happening in our text. The walls have been rebuilt. The gates have been reopened. The temple was restored. And the worship at the temple has been reignited. But there's no people in the city. So there's great things for this epicenter to happen. What couldn't happen um, because it was not sustainable. There, there weren't enough people there. But the city of Jerusalem, for it to exist and for it to be that beacon of light on the hill, people had to move in to cause that reality. And I think you understand if you read the Old Testament, God really, really, really loved Jerusalem. God had a deep, deep concern for Jerusalem. The city of God, you could say, the city of David. It's mentioned 37 times in the book of Nehemiah and 1,000 times in the Old Testament. And if God is going to mention something a thousand times, maybe it's important. Maybe there's something about Jerusalem that we need to know as God's people. Maybe there's something about Jerusalem that we're going to see again on the day of days. Because it's a city that God loves. It was special, beautiful in his eyes. But we read in a few chapters earlier, in chapter 7, verse 4, that the city was large and spacious. This is after they had built the wall. But there were very few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. rebuilt. People are like, I'm not moving there. Um, even in chapter 7, they, they kind of register all the people that lived in Judea at that time that had come out of Babylon. And the list is pretty long. But we read at the end of the chapter these verses, the verse 73. But the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with the certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. What it should have said, after they did the registry, was that they settled in Jerusalem. What it took for people to move from their town back into Jerusalem was a revival. Their hearts had to be changed. The things of God had to become more important than the things of this earth. They had to have a lesser hold on the things of this world and a tighter hold on the things of, of the next, as we should. Because what's happening in this day is that the, 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 the walls were destroyed, and people knew this, so they had rebuilt the walls, but they had realized that all the houses were destroyed. And not only were the houses destroyed, but the economy in Jerusalem was destroyed. And not only was the economy destroyed, but the social fabric, the cultural center, the center for arts, the center for, for legal and parliamentary decisions, everything had become decentralized. There was no hustle and bustle. There was no beautiful thing about this city, Jerusalem, anymore. Not only that, there was a constant threat of the enemies wanting to take over Jerusalem still. And so it's not like the coming attraction. It was in the days of Solomon, it was maybe in the days of Hezekiah, maybe even in Josiah, the kings of, of Judah, but not today. It's very interesting that one of the prophets during the time of Nehemiah was Zechariah, and he's encouraging God's people to have a higher view of Jerusalem and a higher view of the temple. And in chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Who dares despise the day of small things? It was the day of small things in Jerusalem. Nothing like the former glory during the days of Solomon. And so who would want to move in to a city like that? But the chapter starts, this is the result of the revival, the chapter starts and says the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem. Or in the NIV, I said, they settled in Jerusalem. They chose to move in. These men who moved into Jerusalem before others did were spiritually motivated. They were prepared to lead by example whatever the cost. And I think that's the word for God's people today, especially the leaders of this church. 
You know, one of the things I encourage my elders, or my elders, the elders of Mercy Church and the deacons, I say, you need to be leaders worth following. Not just you, me too. (laughs) We need to be leaders worth following. We need to be able to set the example for others to follow that will bring them hopefully closer to Christ, even if it's hard. That's what these men were doing with their wives and their children. They were, they were leading by example, and it wasn't easy for them. But they were motivated spiritually. But even after these leaders moved in, they realized that there were huge swaths of land within, within uh, Jerusalem that, were still, that still needed to be inhabited. And so what they did, they set up this lottery system, and they were kind of rolled a die or something, I don't know. And they figured out that one in ten were going to move into Jerusalem. So you have 10 families, one of those families would move in. And the popula- that's how they would populate. And that's what we get in verse 2. It says in verse 2 of chapter 10, or verse 1, And the rest of the people cast lots to bring out one, one out of 10 to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while 9 out of 10 remain in the other towns. And that's interesting. They're basically being voluntold to move into the city. Sometimes we do that. We don't really, we're, we're going to volunteer you, but you can't say no. So I'm not sure what that means. So we call it voluntold. So they were voluntold. What's interesting is two things. The people realize this, verse 2, and the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. So the lot was cast. They were voluntold to move back into Jerusalem. And then they were blessed because they willingly went. What does that mean? It means this, that they were spiritually motivated in going. They didn't protest. They're like, I'm not going there. Forget that noise. No, they said, we're going to move in because this is God's will for our lives. We're prepared to do whatever he wants us to do. We're talking about musicians and gatekeepers, Levites and priests, men of valor, men of standing, men and women who are recognized in their communities. They were all responding to the call. They were giving up their security, the security of their extended family even. They were giving up their home and their spacious properties. I don't know if you've ever seen Jerusalem, but it's pretty tight. Many would have grown, given up their income source, and they entered into a place where they had to rebuild their homes, and they have to deal with the insecurity of those walls around them. They went in faith. Now others, we learn, stayed back. They still had to kind of feed the economy of Jerusalem, they had to do trade with Jerusalem, so there was trade happening within the, within the countryside, and God said one in ten would move in. He said, what does that have to do with any of us this afternoon? I mean, you might get a job in Jerusalem, an IT job, or I don't know, a tourist guide. I don't know what you do in Jerusalem, lots of things. Well, you're not moving into the city of God if you move to Jerusalem today. It just doesn't exist. It's just a city like any other city. So what does it mean for us if Jerusalem is not the place that we need to move into? Well, we are the church of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but when we established Mercy Church in East Hamilton, which I think in some ways is similar to Redeeming Grace, you established this church here to be a neighborhood church, to be a church in the neighborhood, to shine the light of Jesus into this community. Can I get an amen there? Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing here. Part of that reality, some of you have realized, to make that effective, you need to be physically present. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to shine the light of Jesus from this pulpit. It's another thing to walk with your neighbor to the store or to talk to your neighbor beside here and say, why don't you come with me to church? I'm just down the road. And begin to know, get to know the neighborhood where your church is trying to shine the light so that they can see your actions and glorify God who who, who has helped you with those, who, who has, who, who, who's given you the strength to do that. When we, um, I'm just going to throw out what we did at Mercy and take it as you wish. <laughs> so I said that this morning, I said many of you remember, each of us was asked to pray earnestly to God whether it was his calling for us to sell our homes to move into this area. Now I'm talking to the congregation at Mercy Church this morning. And I said, my wife and I put that to prayer, and the Lord heard our prayers, and he answered them, and he opened up a way for us to move into the neighborhood. So we moved into East Hamilton. We moved from the beautiful tropics of the mountain uh, into the lower Hamilton. 
I said others prayed and felt the Lord was not calling them to move into the neighborhood just yet. Others prayed and they realized that it wasn't going to be possible for the next five or ten years for whatever reasons. Maybe they're running a business out of their home and they needed more property. And then I said COVID hit and it seemed everybody put their prayers on hold <laughs> because nobody moved or the prices went up. The insurances, all the interest rates started to go up but the prices went way up and nobody moved in. Or very few people moved in. I told the congregation, I reminded them this afternoon, this morning that COVID was done. So I'm hoping for a great influx. So, but what we delighted to do by moving into East Hamilton, where we needed to, a Reformed church, was to shine the light of the gospel by having a ministry of presence. You, you can't let someone see the light of Christ if you're not present. The light of Christ shines through you, through your good deeds, and through what you're going to say to them. And so we want to, con- to encourage the congregation to be present. And then I said to them this. If you're not prepared to pray about this, if you're not prepared to fast and pray about this, and give this question over to the Lord, Lord, do you want me and my family, or me individually, to move into East Hamilton? I'm talking to the Mercy folks here. If you're not prepared to pray about this, I'm going to encourage you to find another church. No one left. We have people coming all the way from Niagara Falls. I don't know if you know geography around here. That's like 50 minutes or something. We want to be a neighborhood church, and to be a neighborhood church, we want to be present in our neighborhood, and we want to shine the love of Christ. We want to do prayer walks in the neighborhood. We want to get to know everybody in our community so that we have opportunity for them to come to know Jesus. Other churches have other neighborhoods, and that's their burden, and that's their joy. Our neighborhood has been given to us to love and to serve. Are you prepared to move in? If not, have you put it to prayer? If you haven't put it to prayer, why, why haven't you put it to prayer? And what's the Lord showing you? I'm going to leave that and hold that all in tension. That's something that you have to work out with the Lord. That's beautiful. But it forces the question. It forces the question is, what are we doing with our physical life in the context of the spiritual life? Or what you could say, what are we doing with the, with, the, with the knowledge of the city of God in the context of living in the city of man? You and I wake up in the city of man. What we see around us is the city of man. But the city of God is, is his church being built out of that city of man, and, and it's to his glory. So how, how, do, how do we hold that intention? How do we serve God with our physical lives in, in, in light of that city of God, in light of his calling upon our life? Because moving into Jerusalem, or moving anywhere for the cause of the gospel, it's not about us. It's not some kind of ascetic journey, you know, asceticism where you, you just enter this world of self-discipline and, and you try to avoid all earthly pleasures. It, that can so quickly become a religion in and of itself, and it's really self-worship. Look at me. Look at how ascetic I am. Look how humble I am. Look at the things I'm doing for Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. You know, there's a much deeper motivation that's happening in our text and must continue to happen in God's people for the glory of Christ's name. Let me share a brief story about that this, that happened this weekend. This weekend, um, we had a youth, no, I always say that, young adults retreat. Uh, they're between the ages of 18 and 27. We went to Niagara on the lake, we, so we left Hamilton, and um, stayed there for the weekend. And because of the snow, we didn't have as many people as we wanted, but we still had about 10 of us there. It was nice. We had three sessions. Some of you might know his name, uh, Wilf Bout. He led those sessions uh, with his wife, Sharon, and encouraging us to fix our eyes on Jesus. We picked uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 as our, as our theme text for the weekend. And I was there with my wife as well. The third session, he had left, and, and we were there, and, and, and we asked all those who were with us this question, in light of of Hebrews 12, verse 1, which reads this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That was our theme text, and that's what we talked about. And so we asked the question to our group, this one. Who has had the greatest impact on your spiritual life? 
Maybe you can think about this question as you go home tonight. And we're, and we're going to ask you this, and we ask this question in the context of someone outside the biblical narrative, outside the biblical figures, but someone in history since the Pentecost to, to Pentecost to present, or someone who has almost finished the race, so the elderly, who in that demographic, you could say, has had the greatest impact on your spiritual life? Who has inspired you to follow Jesus, who has inspired you in your pursuit of following Jesus, who has fueled you with a greater passion to serve him? And what was surpri- I don't think it was surprising, but it just surprised me, so maybe it was surprising. Everyone that went, that spoke, spoke stories of missionaries. That was somewhat surprising. Or a grandparent or great-grandparent who was in the war. Each of them pointing to the fact that they had given up some pleasures of this world for the sake of Christ. Or they were denied pleasures, but through the denial, they grew closer to Christ and became a better witness for Christ. Some of the stories that were shared um, as we went around the room just to talk about, you know, who has inspired you in your faith life? The the five missionaries in in Ecuador who who, who were stabbed on the beaches, uh, the Waigani tribe by the Waigani people. Gladys Alward, the the female missionary who served in, in China. Louis Inks, the founder of Rain Ministries. Adoniram Dutson, who gave his life, basically, to the cause of the gospel in Burma. Steve Green, someone mentioned, who didn't really become a missionary, but was sold out for the gospel. Some of you might remember Steve Green uh, in your day. Missionaries who are serving for 40, 50 years overseas in remote places with nobody remembering or recognizing them and just faithfully giving and re- translating the gospel for, for, this, for Christ's sake and for the salvation of the people there. Great-grandparents who had suffered during the war, even in prison camps, but never lost their love for Jesus and were constantly using that love for the sake of the other. I found that remarkable. The people that inspire us are those who are willing to give up something for the service of the king. So I challenged them, as I would as a pastor, and I challenged myself. What is your legacy for the next generation? How do you want to be remembered? How are you going to inspire the next generation to continue to carry that flame, to continue to run with perseverance, to continue to long to be in the city of our God one day. You see, Hebrews 12, therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, is built on the basis of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, all these people, these are Old Testament figures, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. That's the same as us. We are not inhabitants of the city of God. That day will come when the new Jerusalem descends and we all become citizens of that great city in person, physically present in the city of God. But there is no city of God physically present on earth. So in every single way today, we are foreigners and strangers in this land. Verse 14, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of of the country that they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Listen, for he has prepared a city for them. God's all about the city. The people of Israel were repopulating Jerusalem, the city of God. Sacrificing their livelihood and their comfort, ultimately, to usher in the Savior of the world. The strong connection between Jerusalem and Jesus, you understand. He's the author and the, and the builder of the city. But he's also the redeemer of the city. And as the story unfolds, so they built the city, repopulate the city so that Jesus could come. But as the story unfolds, 400 years later, Jesus shows up on earth. The eighth day, he was brought to the temple. When he was 12 years old, he went to the temple and his mom's like, where's Jesus? She couldn't find him for three days, and then he says to Jesus, she says, Jesus says to his mother, don't you know I am to be in my father's house? 
I'm supposed to be here. Then he began his ministry, and he left from Jerusalem into Galilee. That's where his ministry started. But it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus turned his eyes resolutely on Jerusalem. He's like, I'm here for Jerusalem. But he had realized that Jerusalem's heart had grown cold. The people that had inhabited Jerusalem 400 years ago had long died, and so had the passion for their Savior. The city of man had kind of taken over the city of Jerusalem. A thirst for power and for fame, greed, control, captured that city's heart. Luke 19, verse 41 says that Jesus wept over the city. Would that you have even had known on the day the things that make for peace. Would you have known the days, uh, the things that would make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And so they took Jesus. The inhabitants of this beautiful city, they took Jesus. They tortured him. They led him outside the city. And they crucified him. The author and the architect. It says that Calvary is high enough up on the hill that you can look over from Calvary over the walls into the city. Jesus died looking upon the city. He came to redeem. Little did they know he was redeeming the city when he died, and then he died. He rose again, and where did he go? He went back to the city. He found his disciples in the city. That's not all. He said, wait in the city. Don't go anywhere until the Holy Spirit comes. And then you go. And so the Holy Spirit came down in the city. They preached the gospel. Many were saved in the city. And from that city called Jerusalem, which no longer has any merit on this earth in this present day, really, it went out to all the earth, Judea, Samaria, Antioch, and to the ends of the earth. And then we read in the Bible that Jesus ascended. And then we're told that he will come back the same way. But then we're told in, in Revelation chapter 21 that this holy city, Jerusalem, is still, is still coming. It says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is the story of the Bible. We begin in a garden and we end in a garden city, the new Jerusalem which will be very spacious. So why share all this? Let me close with this. Because right now, the Lord God Almighty wants you to be a citizen of that city. Not the physical city of Jerusalem in Israel. No, a citizen of the city that is to come, whose architect and builder is God. That's your citizenship. Philippians 3 verse 20 says, Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we await our Savior from there. He said, well, how do I become a citizen of that city? How do I become a, city, a citizen of the city of God? How do I make sure my name is listed in the code, in, 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 the, in the books of that city? How, how do I know I'm registered there? Well, it's not that hard. You are registered in that city when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of your faith. You're registered in that city when you confess your sins and trust, entrust your life to Jesus. When you repent and say, Jesus, forgive me. I love you, Lord. And I'm going to pursue you for the rest of my life. And once you are a citizen of that city, you are secure in your eternal home. But as you are secure in your eternal home, and until, sorry, until you enter into the city, which will happen when you die, until you enter the city, or Jesus comes back, until you enter that city, listen, you still have one foot in the city of man. God hasn't taken you out of the city of man yet. You have one foot in the city of man where evil is fomenting, where people are opposing Jesus, are opposing the church, opposing the Bible, and that anti-Christian view is only growing in the city of man against the city of God, against all that the city of God represents. And we feel it and we taste it every day. 
But because our citizenship is secure in glory, because we are even seated in the heavenlies, we have one foot seated in place in the city of God. Because that is true, we have nothing to fear as we live out our days in the city of man. We do not fear to have our children in the city of man. We do not fear to, 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 to step out in faith in the city of man. Because ultimately the city of God will win. Because ultimately we are secure in our citizenship. Because ultimately Jesus will destroy the city of man one day. In between that time, we are sharing the hope of salvation to the city of man. We are called this day, loved ones, in our physical life, in all of our decisions, to follow the dictates, the precepts, the policies, you could say, of the city of God. Our marching orders come from that city, not the city of man. The author of the city of man is the devil, and he holds people in, in, in check. And the author of the city of God is our Lord Jesus Christ, and he holds people in his beautiful hands of grace, and he leads them. But in the midst of all this, we hear these words from Andrew Peterson, and some of you know this song. I'll close with this song. It says, do you feel the world is broken? And the answer is we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? In the city of man. And the answer is we do. But then it has this beautiful line. But do you know. That all the dark won't stop the light. From getting through. That light comes from the city of God. That light is a light from heaven. And the answer is we do. And do you wish that you could see it all made new? And God's people say, we do. We do. We long to see the new Jerusalem. We long to be walking with our Savior down the streets of gold. We long to see him in his glorious city and to see his light shine so brightly. But in the meantime, loved ones, remember your citizenship. You are children of the light. You are children of that city, and you go in confidence and show your good deeds to a world that's lost in darkness, and through that, may they praise your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that we have so much security. We thank you for what we learned from our Old Testament saints who, having experienced a revival, chose to move into the city of God, to become its inhabitants, to sing your praises, to offer sacrifices, and to wait the coming Messiah. And we thank you that he has come. Lord, we know that your physical city, the, city, the new Jerusalem, will come one day, but in the meantime, we are citizens of the city, and we thank you for that. Fill us with courage, O oh God, the courage that they had in the Old Testament now filled to the fullest because of what Christ has done. Give us the courage to live out our days in the city of man, knowing that we actually don't really belong here, knowing that this is not really our home. So help us not to fix our highs on the things of this world and to, to expend our energies on things that don't matter. Even our homes, our vacations, things that just will all perish. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to be true citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the city of our God. And to live out that joy in all that we do, shining forth the glory of your kingdom.